Chapter 12 of The Mysterious Stranger and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysterious Stranger and Other Stories by Mark Twain. A Fable. Once upon a time an artist who had painted a small and very beautiful picture placed it so that he could see it in the mirror. He said, This doubles the distance and softens it, and it is twice as lovely as it was before. The animals out in the woods heard of this through the house-cat, who was greatly admired by them because he was so learned and so refined and civilized and so polite and high-bred, and could tell them so much which they didn't know before, and were not certain about afterward. They were much excited about this new piece of gossip, and they asked questions so as to get a full understanding of it. They asked what a picture was, and the cat explained. It is a flat thing, he said, wonderfully flat, marvelously flat, enchantingly flat and elegant, and oh, so beautiful. That excited them almost to a frenzy, and they said they would give the world to see it. Then the bear asked, What is it that makes it so beautiful? It is the looks of it, said the cat. This filled them with admiration and uncertainty, and they were more excited than ever. Then the cow asked, What is a mirror? It is a hole in the wall, said the cat. You look in it, and there you see the picture, and it is so dainty and charming and ethereal and inspiring in its unimaginable beauty that your head turns round and round, and you almost swoon with ecstasy. The ass had not said anything as yet. He now began to throw doubts. He said there had never been anything as beautiful as this before, and probably wasn't now. He said that when it took a whole basketful of sesquipedalian adjectives to whoop up a thing of beauty, it was time for suspicion. It was easy to see that these doubts were having an effect upon the animals, so the cat went off offended. The subject was dropped for a couple of days. But in the meantime, curiosity was taking a fresh start, and there was a revival of interest perceptible. Then the animals assailed the ass for spoiling what could possibly have been a pleasure to them, on a mere suspicion that the picture was not beautiful without any evidence that such was the case. The ass was not troubled. He was calm and said there was one way to find out who was in the right, himself or the cat. He would go and look in that hole, and come back and tell what he found there. The animals felt relieved and grateful, and asked him to go at once, which he did. But he did not know where he ought to stand, and so, through error, he stood between the picture and the mirror. The result was that the picture had no chance, and didn't show up. He returned home and said, "'The cat lied!' There was nothing in that hole but an ass. There wasn't a sign of a flat thing visible. It was a handsome ass, and friendly, but just an ass, and nothing more. The elephant asked, Did you see it good and clear? Were you close to it? I saw it good and clear, O oh Hathi, king of beasts. I was so close that I touched noses with it. This is very strange, said the elephant. The cat was always truthful before, as far as we could make out. Let another witness try. Go, Baloo, look in the hole, and come and report. So the bear went. When he came back, he said, Both the cat and the ass have lied. There was nothing in the hole but a bear. Great was the surprise and puzzlement of the animals. Each was now anxious to make the test himself and get at the straight truth. The elephant sent them one at a time. First the cow. She saw nothing in the hole but a cow. The tiger found nothing in it but a tiger. The lion found nothing in it but a lion. The leopard found nothing in it but a leopard. The camel found a camel and nothing more. 
Then Hathi was wroth and said he would have the truth if he had to go and fetch it himself. When he returned, he abused his whole subjectry for liars, and was in an unappeasable fury with the moral and mental blindness of the cat. He said that anybody but a near-sighted fool could see that there was nothing in the hole but an elephant. Moral by the Cat You can find in a text whatever you bring, if you will stand between it and the mirror of your imagination. You may not see your ears, but they will be there. Hunting the Deceitful Turkey when I was a boy, my uncle and his big boys hunted with the rifle, the youngest boy Fred and I with a shotgun, a small single-barreled shotgun which was properly suited to our size and strength. It was not much heavier than a broom. We carried it turn about half an hour at a time. I was not able to hit anything with it, but I liked to try. Fred and I hunted feathered small game. The others hunted deer, squirrels, wild turkeys, and such things. My uncle and the big boys were good shots. They killed hawks and wild geese and such like on the wing, and they didn't wound or kill squirrels. They stunned them. When the dogs treat a squirrel, the squirrel would scamper aloft and run out on a limb and flatten himself along it, hoping to make himself invisible in that way, and not quite succeeding. You could see his wee little ears sticking up. You couldn't see his nose, but you knew where it was. Then the hunter, despising a rest for his rifle, stood up and took off-hand aim at the limb and sent a bullet into it immediately under the squirrel's nose, and down tumbled the animal, unwounded but unconscious. The dogs gave him a shake, and he was dead. Sometimes, when the distance was great and the wind not accurately allowed for, the bullet would hit the squirrel's head. The dogs could do as they pleased with that one. The hunter's pride was hurt, and he wouldn't allow it to go into the game bag. In the first faint gray of the dawn, the stately wild turkeys would be stalking around in great flocks, and ready to be sociable and answer invitations to come and converse with other excursionists of their kind. The hunter concealed himself and imitated the turkey call by sucking the air through the leg-bone of a turkey which had previously answered a call like that, and lived only just long enough to regret it. There is nothing that furnishes a perfect turkey call except that bone. Another of nature's treacheries, you see. She is full of them. Half the time she doesn't know which she likes best, to betray her child or protect it. In the case of the turkey, she is badly mixed. She gives it a bone to be used in getting it into trouble, and she also furnishes it with a trick for getting itself out of the trouble again. When a mama turkey answers an invitation and finds she has made a mistake in accepting it, she does as the mama partridge does, remembers a previous engagement, and goes limping and scrambling away, pretending to be very lame, and at the same time she is saying to her not visible children, Lie low, keep still, don't expose yourselves. I shall be back as soon as I have beguiled this shabby swindler out of the country. When a person is ignorant and confiding, this immoral device can have tiresome results. I followed an ostensibly lame turkey over a considerable part of the United States one morning, because I believed in her and could not think she would deceive a mere boy, and one who was trusting her and considering her honest. I had the single-barreled shotgun, but my idea was to catch her alive. I often got within rushing distance of her, and then made my rush, but always, just as I made my final plunge and put my hand down where her back had been, it wasn't there. It was only two or three inches from there, and I brushed the tail feathers as I landed on my stomach, a very close call, but still not quite close enough. That is, not close enough for success, but just close enough to convince me that I could do it next time. She always waited for me a little piece away, and led on to be resting and greatly fatigued, which was a lie, but I believed it, for I still thought her honest long after I ought to have begun to doubt her, suspecting that this was no way for a high-minded bird to be acting. 
I followed and followed and followed, making my periodical rushes and getting up and brushing the dust off and resuming the voyage with patient confidence, indeed with a confidence which grew, for I could see by the change of climate and vegetation that we were getting up into the high latitudes, and as she always looked a little tireder and a little more discouraged after each rush, I judged that I was safe to win, in the end, the competition being purely a matter of staying power, and the advantage lying with me from the start, because she was lame. Along in the afternoon I began to feel fatigued myself. Neither of us had had any rest since we first started on the excursion, which was upwards of ten hours before, though latterly we had paused a while after rushes, I letting on to be thinking about something else, but neither of us sincere, and both of us waiting for the other to call game, but in no real hurry about it, for indeed those little evanescent snatches of rest were very grateful to the feelings of us both. It would naturally be so, skirmishing along like that ever since dawn, and not a bite in the meantime. At least for me, though sometimes, as she lay on her side, fanning herself with a wing and praying for strength to get out of this difficulty, a grasshopper happened along, whose time had come, and that was well for her and fortunate, but I had nothing, nothing the whole day. More than once after I was very tired I gave up taking her alive, and was going to shoot her, but I never did, although it was my right, for I did not believe I could hit her, and besides, she always stopped and posed when I raised the gun, and this made me suspicious that she knew about me and my marksmanship, and so I did not care to expose myself to remarks. I did not get her at all. When she got tired of the game at last, she rose from almost under my hand and flew aloft with the rush and whir of a shell and lit on the highest limb of a great tree, and sat down and crossed her legs and smiled down at me, and seemed gratified to see me so astonished. I was ashamed and also lost, and it was while wandering the woods hunting for myself that I found a deserted log cabin, and had one of the best meals there that in my life days I have eaten. The weed-grown garden was full of ripe tomatoes, and I ate them ravenously, though I had never liked them before. Not more than two or three times since have I tasted anything that was so delicious as those tomatoes. I surfeited myself with them, and did not taste another one until I was in middle life. I can eat them now, but I do not like the look of them. I suppose we have all experienced a surfeit at one time or another. Once, in stress of circumstances, I ate part of a barrel of sardines, there being nothing else at hand, but since then I have always been able to get along without sardines. THE McWilliamses AND THE BURGLAR ALARM The conversation drifted smoothly and pleasantly along from weather to crops, from crops to literature, from literature to scandal, from scandal to religion, then took a random jump and landed on the subject of burglar alarms. And now, for the first time, Mr. McWilliams showed feeling. Whenever I perceive this sign on this man's dial, I comprehend it and lapse into silence, and give him opportunity to unload his heart. Said he, with but ill-controlled emotion, I do not go one single cent on burglar alarms, Mr. Twain, not a single cent, and I will tell you why. When we were finishing our house, we found we had a little cash left over, on account of the plumber not knowing it. I was for enlightening the heathen with it, for I was always unaccountably down on the heathen somehow, but Mrs. McWilliam said, no, let's have a burglar alarm. I agreed to this compromise. I will explain that whenever I want a thing and Mrs. McWilliam wants another thing, and we decide upon the thing that Mrs. McWilliams wants, as we always do, she calls that a compromise. Very well. The man came up from New York and put in the alarm and charged three hundred and twenty-five dollars for it, and said we could sleep without uneasiness now. So we did, for a while. Say, a month. Then, one night, we smelled smoke, and I was advised to get up and see what the matter was. 
I lit a candle and started toward the stairs, and met a burglar coming out of a room with a basket of tinware which he had mistaken for solid silver in the dark. He was smoking a pipe. I said, My friend, we do not allow smoking in this room. He said he was a stranger and could not be expected to know the rules of the house. Said he had been in many houses, just as good as this one, and it had never been objected to before. He added that as far as his experience went, such rules had never been considered to apply to burglars anyway. I said, smoke along, then, if it is the custom, though I think that the conceding of a privilege to a burglar which is denied to a bishop is a conspicuous sign of the looseness of the times. But waiving all that, what business have you to be entering this house in this furtive and clandestine way without ringing the burglar alarm? He looked confused and ashamed, and said with embarrassment, I beg a thousand pardons. I did not know you had a burglar alarm, else I would have rung it. I beg you will not mention it where my parents may hear of it, for they are old and feeble, and such a seemingly wanton breach of the hallowed conventionalities of our Christian civilization might all too rudely sunder the frail bridge which hangs darkling between the pale and evanescent present and the solemn great deeps of the eternities. May I trouble you for a match? I said, your sentiments do you honor, but if you will allow me to say it, metaphor is not your best hold. Spare your thigh. This kind light only on the box, and seldom there, in fact, if my experience may be trusted. But to return to business, how did you get in here? Through a second-story window. It was even so. I redeemed the tinware at pawnbroker's rates, less cost of advertising, bade the burglar good night, closed the window after him, and retired to headquarters to report. Next morning we sent for the burglar alarm man, and he came up and explained that the reason the alarm did not go off was that no part of the house but the first floor was attached to the alarm. This was simply idiotic. One might as well have no armor on at all in battle as to have it only on his legs. The expert now put the whole second story on the alarm, charged three hundred dollars for it, and went on his way. By and by, one night, I found a burglar in the third story, about to start down a ladder with a lot of miscellaneous property. My first impulse was to crack his head with a billiard cue, but my second was to refrain from his attention, because he was between me and the cue-rack. The second impulse was plainly the soundest, so I refrained, and proceeded to compromise. I redeemed the property at former rates, after deducting ten per cent, for use of ladder, it being my ladder, and next day we sent down for the expert once more, and had the third story attached to the alarm for three hundred dollars. By this time the annunciator had grown to formidable dimensions. It had forty-seven tags on it, marked with the names of the various rooms and chimneys, and it occupied the space of an ordinary wardrobe. The gong was the size of a washbowl, and was placed above the head of our bed. There was a wire from the house to the coachman's quarters in the stable, and a noble gong alongside his pillow. We should have been comfortable now, but for one defect. Every morning, at five, the cook opened the kitchen door, in the way of business, and rip went that gong. The first time this happened, I thought the last day was come sure. I didn't think it in bed, no, but out of it, for the first effect of that frightful gong is to hurl you across the house, and slam you against the wall, and then curl you up and squirm you like a spider on a stove-lid, till somebody shuts the kitchen door. In solid fact there is no clamor that is even remotely comparable to the dire clamor which that gong makes. Well, this catastrophe happened every morning, regularly, at five o'clock, and lost us three hours sleep, for mind you, when that thing wakes you, it doesn't merely wake you in spots, it wakes you all over, conscience and all, and you are good for eighteen hours of wide awakeness subsequently. Eighteen hours of the very most inconceivable wide awakeness that you ever experienced in your life. A stranger died on our hands one time, 
and we vacated and left him in our room overnight. Did that stranger wait for the general judgment? No, sir. He got up at five the next morning in the most prompt and unostentatious way. I knew he would. I knew it mighty well. He collected his life insurance and lived happily ever after, for there was plenty of proof as to the perfect squareness of his death. Well, we were gradually fading toward a better land on account of the daily loss of sleep, so we finally had the expert up again, and he ran a wire to the outside of the door and placed a switch there, whereby Thomas the butler always made one little mistake. He switched the alarm off at night when he went to bed, and switched it on again at daybreak in the morning, just in time for the cook to open the kitchen door and enable that gong to slam us across the house, sometimes breaking a window with one or the other of us. At the end of the week we recognized that this switch business was a delusion and a snare. We also discovered that a band of burglars had been lodging in the house the whole time, not exactly to steal, for there wasn't much left now, but to hide from the police, for they were hot-pressed, and they shrewdly judged that the detectives would never think of a tribe of burglars taking sanctuary in a house notoriously protected by the most imposing and elaborate burglar alarm in America. Sent down for the expert again, and this time he struck a most dazzling idea. He fixed the thing so that opening the kitchen door would take off the alarm. It was a noble idea, and he charged accordingly. But you already foresee the result. I switched on the alarm every night at bedtime, no longer trusting on Thomas's frail memory, and as soon as the lights were out the burglars walked in at the kitchen door, thus taking the alarm off without waiting for Cook to do it in the morning. You see how aggravatingly we were situated. For months we couldn't have any company, not a spare bed in the house, all occupied by burglars. Finally I got up a cure of my own. The expert answered the call and ran another ground wire to the stable and established a switch there so that the coachman could put on and take off the alarm. That worked first rate, and a season of peace ensued, during which we got to inviting company once more and enjoying life. But by and by the irrepressible alarm invented a new kink. One winter's night we were flung out of bed by the sudden music of that awful gong, and when we hobbled to the annunciator, turned up the gas, and saw the word nursery exposed, Mrs. McWilliams fainted dead away, and I came precious near doing the same thing myself. I seized my shotgun, and stood timing the coachman whilst that appalling buzzing went on. I knew that his gong had flung him out, too, and that he would be along with his gun as soon as he could jump into his clothes. When I judged that the time was ripe, I crept to the room next to the nursery, glanced through the window, and saw the dim outline of the coachman in the yard below, standing at present arms and waiting for a chance. Then I hopped into the nursery and fired, and in the same instant the coachman fired at the red flash of my gun. Both of us were successful. I crippled a nurse, and he shot off all my back hair. We turned up the gas and telephoned for a surgeon. There was not a sign of a burglar, and no window had been raised. One glass was absent, but that was where the coachman's charge had come through. Here was a fine mystery, a burglar alarm going off at midnight of its own accord, and not a burglar in the neighborhood. The expert answered the usual call, and explained that it was a false alarm, said it was easily fixed. So he overhauled the nursery window, charged a remunerative figure for it, and departed. What we suffered from false alarms for the next three years no stylographic pen can describe. During the next three months I always flew with my gun to the room indicated, and the coachman always sallied forth with his battery to support me. But there was never anything to shoot at windows all tight and secure. We always sent down for the expert next day, 
and he fixed those particular windows so they would keep quiet a week or so, and always remembered to send us a bill about like this. Wire, two dollars fifteen cents. Nipple, seventy-five cents. Two hours labor, one dollar fifty cents. Wax, forty-seven cents. Tape, thirty-four cents. Screws, fifteen cents. Recharging battery, ninety-eight cents. Three hours labor, two dollars twenty-five cents. String, two cents. Lard, sixty-six cents. Pond's extract, one dollar twenty-five cents. Springs at fifty, two dollars. Railroad fares, seven dollars twenty-five cents. At length, a perfectly natural thing came about after we had answered three or four hundred false alarms. To wit, we stopped answering them. Yes, I simply rose up calmly when slammed across the house by the alarm, calmly inspected the annunciator, took note of the room indicated, and then calmly disconnected that room from the alarm, and went back to bed as if nothing had happened. Moreover, I left that room off permanently, and did not send for the expert. Well, it goes without saying that in the course of time all the rooms were taken off, and the entire machine was out of service. It was at this unprotected time that the heaviest calamity of all happened. The burglars walked in one night, and carried off the burglar alarm. Yes, sir! Every hide and hair of it ripped it out tooth and nail, springs, bells, gongs, battery, and all. They took a hundred and fifty miles of copper wire. They just cleaned her out, bag and baggage, and never left us a vestige of her to swear at. Swear by, I mean. We had a time of it to get her back, but we accomplished it finally for money. The alarm firm said that what we needed now was to have her put in right with their new patent springs in the windows to make false alarms impossible, and their new patent clock attached to take off and put on the alarm morning and night without human assistance. That seemed a good scheme. They promised to have the whole thing finished in ten days. They began work, and we left for the summer. They worked a couple of days, then they left for the summer after which the burglars moved in and began their summer vacation. When we returned in the fall, the house was as empty as a beer closet in premises where painters have been at work. We refurnished, and then sent down to hurry up the expert. He came up and finished the job, and said, Now this clock is set to put on the alarm every night at ten, and take it off every morning at 5.45. All you've got to do is wind her up every week, and then leave her alone. She will take care of the alarm herself. After that we had a most tranquil season during three months. The bill was prodigious, of course, and I had said I would not pay it until the new machinery had proved itself to be flawless. The time stipulated was three months. So I paid the bill, and the very next day the alarm went to buzzing like ten thousand bee swarms at ten o'clock in the morning. I turned the hands around twelve hours according to instructions, and this took off the alarm. But there was another hitch at night, and I had to set her ahead twelve hours once more to get her to put the alarm on again. That sort of nonsense went on for a week or two, then the expert came up and put in a new clock. He came up every three months during the next three years and put in a new clock. But it was always a failure. His clocks all had the same perverse defect. They would put the alarm on in the daytime, and they would not put it on at night. And if you forced it on yourself, they would take it off again the minute your back was turned. Now there is the history of that burglar alarm. Everything just as it happened. Nothing extenuated and not set down in malice. Yes, sir. And when I had slept nine years with burglars and maintained an expensive burglar alarm the whole time for their protection, not mine, and at my sole cost, for not a damned cent could I ever get them to contribute, I just said to Mrs. McWilliams that I had had enough of that kind of pie. So with her full consent, 
I took the whole thing out and traded it off for a dog and shot the dog. I don't know what you think about it, Mr. Twain, but I think those things are made solely in interest of the burglars. Yes, sir, a burglar alarm combines in its person all that is objectionable about a fire, a riot, and a harem, and at the same time had none of the compensating advantages of one sort or another that customarily belong with that combination. Goodbye. I get off here. End of the Mysterious Stranger and Other Stories by Mark Twain This has been a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger and Other Stories Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during May 2008. Thank you for listening.